Hey, Matt, welcome to the show. Is a way of getting started. Tell us about yourself. Hey, thanks a lot, Brian. Yeah, well, I, I'm, I, uh, I'm actually not a traditional salesperson. I'm probably not your average guest because I think you've you've had a lot of people on the on the podcast who have a lot more experience with with sales training and and with uh, you know professional sales techniques and stuff that I do. I'm more of a I actually started as an engineer in Silicon Valley back in 2000, just down the street from you in Milpitas. Yep. And wow, you know, I, I ended up attached at the hip to some salespeople. And this is back in the, in the peak, right? When you could hold up a sign that said, we'll sell network equipment for food and people would roll their windows down. Yeah. And so I was attached to the hip at some salespeople, with some salespeople. And I remember going to visit customers and thinking, I would never buy something with the way that we're trying to sell it. <laughs> like I would never do it. <laughs> now why? I was, it was all wrong. You know, I, I went from that to, to being, uh, to being in charge of some fairly large technology environments, you know, where there was a lot of money being spent. And, and I was the one kind of making the decisions on, on how much we were going to spend with whom and people would show up and just had no idea how to how to make sure that they were addressing what I wanted. They were addressing, you know, what they wanted. And and wow, it was frustrating. But I had a couple of experiences with people who who they made the whole transaction about understanding me and making sure that they were understanding my definition of success. And and so I ended up in this I've I've been in that role a couple of times where I was kind of working with the working with the sales team or helping drive business. And what I found is by doing what those people did instead of doing what you know the salespeople I didn't like did, I was able to in many cases drive business that the sales team couldn't drive. Yeah. And you know, actually, uh, Peter Thiel talks about this in Zero to One. He says in a complex sale, after a certain point, people don't want to talk to the salesperson; they want to talk to the subject matter expert, whether it's the CEO or the engineer or whatever. Right? Well, there's no reason the salesperson can't be the subject matter expert, and many of them are. Right. Yeah. Uh, but a lot aren't. So but that's it. I think, you know, because I came from a similar background as you, I, w I was the engineer that went with the salespeople uh -huh. and they'd yeah. say, okay, now Brian will tell you about how it works. <laughs> yeah. Well, and then I said, well, I can do that. I can say, now I will tell you how it works. Right. Right. Um, <clears throat> so you saw that as a major difference. They weren't adding enough value. It wasn't just that. It's the, so here's, here's the survival mechanism that I developed, Brian, which is, and cause now I'm doing it for the company I currently work for. I'm, I'm, I've taken pole position in business development, even though I'm running the company, I'm like, we, we've got to go out and change the way that we drive business. And so the survival mechanism I developed is I just refused to become a salesperson and decided to keep being the customer. And every time I end up in front of a customer, I just say, if I were sitting in their chair, what would make me not want to open up? And I'm not even trying to get the sale. I'm trying to get the information that I need yeah, to be able talking. to give them the best sale, right? Yeah. And you do that by being them. And man, I've listened to, I listen to occasionally a, a sales training video here or there, or I you know, read an article. And the things that I see people talking about would never extract a penny from my, well, they wouldn't even give you the information that you need. Yeah. So I've, you know, as a, in the process, I developed some, some principles that I, you know, that probably you could articulate better than I can, but that have really made a huge difference uh, that have opened doors in fortune 100 companies for me that I have no business opening. I have no, I don't even have the skills to open them. Well, let us talk about them. They sound interesting. <laughs> <laughs> what would you say one of them is? Well, I mean, the first one of course is being the customer. Um, but be, even before that, what's that? Well, I mean, I like that, but how do you do that? What's the think thought process you go through? So, well, okay. The first thing that I, that I hope to do when I'm being the customer is to go all in with the customer. So I did the upfront work to make sure that what we're selling, what we're providing is sufficiently aligned, is a hundred percent aligned with the customer, with the customer's outcomes, right? Yeah. And because we're a hundred percent aligned, in other words, I made absolutely sure that if the customer wins, we win and in no other way. Yeah. And what that means is now when I get with the customer, I'm not even, there's not even a, a molecule in my brain that is thinking what's in it for us. How am I going to get this sale? I go a hundred percent in for the customer and going nine, the difference between 99% in for the customer versus a hundred 
is the screen comes down. Yeah. Because right. they don't care about you. They care about themselves. They're trying yeah. to solve a real thing. And when they sense any disingenuineness in you, right. focusing on what you want. Well, it's, you can't even fake it. You can't even, you, can't you know, it. if like, if you're, if you're sincere, if I really am willing to walk away from there with nothing, except I gave the customer some value, then paradoxically, great things happen, right? But if you're just holding on to that, oh, I got to hit my, so I have an advantage because I don't have a quota, right? I run the company. <laughs> I, I didn't choose to well, get you, my. But you, you, you don't have a quota, but you have a lifestyle. You I have. sure do. Yeah. <laughs> I've got, you know, business growth goals. Yeah. So, so that's the first thing is, is I go all in for the customer, 100%. And that enables them to, that, like, you can see it when the, the moment when they go, oh, here's someone who can help me. Yes. And as soon as that happens, and it's not like you do that and now you can really sell at them. No, you just, you, you build up from how to be the customer. Yeah. Right. Instead of trying to battle objections, <clears throat> re wrestle them or outsmart them or right. you know, tell if them. If you're not you willing to walk away without the sale, you can't win. If right. they smell commission breath on you, you're done. Yeah. In today's environment, you're done. They, they got a thousand people who want to sit down and take their time and steal their money. And so this thinking like the customer, how long did it take you to get to this? Zero. Zero. Because <laughs> I didn't have any sales skills. But what I saw was customers who were, they, you know what they really need? It, it's, it's funny. If you're selling really well, if you're really uncovering your, what your customer need, customers need in a consultative way, what you're actually doing is leadership. Yeah. Right. And, to, and, and there's a whole, there's a ton of, of literature on how to be an effective leader. And, you know, you read articles about how 85% or whatever of the workforce is disengaged in the work and doesn't like their boss and whatever. And if you read all the reasons why salespeople, or excuse me, employees and leaders aren't connecting, and you look at how people go from being an employee who understands what good leadership looks like to being a leader who forgot, yeah. that translates almost one for one to the relationship between the customer and the salesperson. And in most companies, the sale, the, the best salesperson usually is the CEO or the founder. Because, uh, it's some, yeah. Well, yeah. a good CEO. I, yeah. yeah. As opposed to the hired gun, not the hired gun or the person sure. the VC put in. Oh, yeah, the, yeah, yeah. The founder CEO who's sure. passionate yeah. about it. Right. And, you know, did this through their own either funding time or sweat equities. Right. Instead of studying management science. Right. Instead of just going, <laughs> getting an MBA and coming from McKinsey and, or right. entrepreneur in residence. Yeah. Um, you know what? There's, there's another thing though, that I think is that comes before understanding the customer's need. And I think maybe this is an advantage I have because I'm not in sales per se, because I'm trying to grow a company, not grow sales. And that is, and I know from having been the engineer that if you want to really thrive in sales, your first customer has to be the people who are delivering value to your customers. It has to be the employees you work with. And in most of the companies I've worked with, there was a, there was barely a relationship between sales and engineering or sales and marketing. And, you know, there's a lot of animosity. And the thing is, wherever I go, so the company I'm managing right now, client focus, Everybody in the company knows how their job contributes to getting and keeping and upgrading customers. Everybody knows it. As a result, when I go out to meet with large groups of customers, uh, what, what I find is a whole bunch of people standing up giving us testimonials talking about our awesome employee who helps them. Yeah. The difference between that and going out and selling stuff that your people can't deliver on and then coming back to the company and saying, well, hey, I'm just trying to take care of the customer and implying that they don't like the customer. Yeah. You know, those are actually altruistic people who want to do a great job most of the time. And yeah. you're making them feel like they're going to fail and, and look bad. So I would say if you want to be successful with your customer, you have to first go be successful with the people who are delivering for your customer. And that seems pretty rare. It's very rare because you got the islands uh, from a, both a political and a functional standpoint. And there's uh, moats in between these islands. Right. And right. they're judged on different things that are sometimes are in conflict. Right. You know, and who owns the client? Yeah. So that's, I think uh, a lot of the big game hunters will, will not like what I have to say about that. 
my approach has been, so yeah, I think you have to understand our situation here. So we work with small businesses to help them stop focusing exclusively on top line acquisition and start balancing that with retention and monetization and stuff. A lot of those customers are, insur are insurance agencies. Okay. But if you want to get in front of lots of insurance agencies, you actually have to go to the carriers. Well, some of the carriers are Fortune 100 companies it's doing huge. many yeah. tens or even a hundred or a billion dollars worth of revenue a year. And everybody in the world wants to talk to them. So you don't just schedule an appointment with the, with the EVP of sales. Ask for 15 minutes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, right. So, so my approach to that is go find some place where you can start small, where nobody's looking. Over invest. Look, if you overinvest in something small like that, you're, you're, you're not breaking the bank. Right. Uh, get some experience there, but create a result that's so profound that the blast radius of that, of that success includes stakeholders to the left and to the right and north in a way that, you, that, you, that they can see, wow, here's somebody who's actually delivering his results that we care yeah. about. Getting in front of that next tier is really easy. And I've found in a very, I took over business development a year ago and with, with basically one relationship. And now I've been able to, to make it to senior levels of, I've, I've been able to get in, in, in front of people with, who are producing multi-billion dollar revenue per year and people with 11 figure targets, right? Like that's, a, that's what we call a BFN where I come from. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the thing is, by the time I get in front of that person, I'm not saying, hey, here's who I am and I'd, I'd like to do business with everybody south of you. I'm saying, Hey, I just thought I'd let you know about the results that we've been, I know you've heard about this. Here are the results that we're producing. Here's how we're doing it. Uh, I'd love to be able to, to do whatever we can to help. But look, it just, we're able to make our mistakes on a very small scale. My yep. people are able to attune themselves to these, this particular environment. And as you climb, you get better and better and better. And that, that the northbound doors open more and more easily instead of, you know, <laughs> so it's, I, I right. found it very effective. Yeah. Because I think most, uh, elephant hunters would go top down. Yeah. Well, and so when you go top down, first of all, you get one or two shots at that a year. And yep. sometimes, I mean, I had one of those happen with a, a $20 million bid where we ended up losing the bid and the elephant hunter, that was his only shot for the year. Yeah. Right. We lost it to a competitor who undercut us on price. But not only that, when you do something at that kind of scale, you then have to take that huge thing back to your, the people who produce and say, hey, here's this thing you didn't see coming that you have no idea how to deliver on and we can't mess it up. Right, yeah, flawlessly the first time. Yeah, yeah, on a, on a scale with, the, with that scale of stakeholder. Look, you know, if, if, you're a, if you're McKinsey, maybe you can pull that off, I don't know. But I think for most people, that's it's the bottom up approach has, for me at least as a survival mechanism, as I mentioned, with no training, has, has in one year's time gotten me in front of so many mid to senior level stakeholders who are already eager to hear what I have to say that it's just been incredible. Right, because I think too many salespeople stick with the meeting, presentation, demo, and let's come up with a proposal. Right, right, right. And I bet in your business that would get you nowhere. Well, I mean, even when I was in technology, what you're doing is walking into some executive's room and saying, here are the reasons that you should align with me. Yeah. And you have no idea. You can't, you can't even spend enough time with an EVP of whatever to figure out what, what they really need. They don't even know what they need. How they are you going to figure it out in a right. dog and pony show that starts in an off hour meeting? XYZ company was founded in 1984 and has become the, it's like, you got to be kidding me. Yeah. I mean, th this is the difference between the complex sale and the simple sale. Yeah. And, and, and especially in your sale and most of the things that I've sold, you've got to keep momentum with them. You have to have a reason to continue a conversation with them. And, yeah. and in your description of thinking like the client, be the client, you, you, you've got to be part of the, the DNA, part of the, the muffin that they're making. Yeah. Yeah. You can't and be so on that... the outside consulting on the muffin. You've got to be in an ingredient in it. So that, that's, I think, you just brought up the thing that I would say has been most powerful for me, which is, which is my disposition toward helping them make that muffin. And the thing that I found that works, and maybe this is, this will sound like pie in the sky, but I have been giving on an extraordinary scale. 
to, to prospects and customers, uh, I, I've developed something that I call asymmetric value. And that is, that is, there are things that you or I have that we've gotten over the years with years and years and years of sunk costs already. It's our, it's our knowledge and our expertise, our experience, some skills that we have, some reputations, uh, uh, some narratives that we've built over the years that could be, it could represent many hundreds of dollars of consultative value in a short conversation. Yes. You know, I mean, one introduction could be worth thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars to a stakeholder. And, but it costs me nothing. So I call it asymmetric value. I go around giving asymmetric value, something that costs me nothing, but it's immensely valuable. I've learned how to do that all day, every day, in every single interaction at work, at church, at the restaurant, wherever I go, I'm, I've practiced, what do I have that I can just give this person right now that costs me nothing? that will make them say, wow, I hope he comes back sometime. It's always, I always get a lot of value when he shows up. And what happens is inevitably some of, that, some of those people start giving back asymmetric value. They share the relationship that you need or they give you access to some information or they give you a shot at, produce, at you know, working with their team. Or, uh, and that being in giving mode is part of that going in 100% for the customer. And it might sound cheesy, it might sound, but look, I'm just telling you, I, we've, we're on a growth curve we've never seen before. And it's because there are a bunch of customers out there who see our whole organization as doing whatever we can to help them without regard for ourselves. Well, I think it's a mindset thing and it, it pulls in the law of reciprocation. Yeah. And, yep. and that when you show up with something, as opposed to empty hand it and complain about the the situation. Right, right. You know, you show up with a bottle of wine, you show up with something of value to them. Yeah. That they feel uh a sense, first of all, that you you break through that friend or foe. Are you mm -hmm. here to eat my food or give me food? <laughs> right, right. I, <laughs> the person who wants to eat the food, no one wants. Right. The person who brings food is welcome. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Now a lot of people find like, what do you bring? I mean, and I'm sure the people who are listening yeah. to this, well, I'm not the CEO. I don't drive the whole company. I'm just a, well, that's a, true. Yeah. 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 I, I hear you. Except I was doing this when I was an engineer. You did. Right. Working with salespeople, just get in and figure out. I, I, I would kind of ignore, like, I will say the salespeople were great at kicking the door in. Yeah. Right, because I had no, and I still, I don't know how to do that. I have, yeah. I, have, I have no skills for going into some foreign territory, kicking in a door and saying, here I am. Yeah. But, uh, but after that, it was like, let me take care of this customer. Let me show them, you know, sometimes I'd, we'd sell something smaller because I'd show them how they could accomplish what they were trying to do with less spend and get better quality. And that would kind of startle the sales team. But then we would get four or five or six follow-on purchases uh, with increasing margins. I mean, it's, look, you want to sell margins, you got to be getting that third and fourth and fifth sale and become their exclusive partner. Yeah. Now, did you, were there any reps at the company that were mentors to you that got it, that were able to carry a conversation, spread? Uh, no, no. I was having engineering conversations with engineers. We're talking about in my past as an engineer, yeah. I was having engineering conversations with people who were trying to solve engineering problems and who happened to own the budget. Hmm. Right. That's and so, so that was, that, that was easy. They recognized somebody was there trying to solve the puzzle with them and having fun doing it and being there just for the sake of, hey, let's see if we can do something cool. And whatever, I'm an engineer. I don't care about the money. Right. And I really didn't. You know? and yeah, so, that's, that was my background too. And you know, what I found was if you didn't, if you, yeah, you couldn't just do the demo. You had to go in and yeah. un understand what they were trying to do and then show how it would work with your stuff. Yeah, right. Yep. Well, what are some of your other principles? <sighs> okay, yeah, that's a great question. So uh, I, think I, I think I didn't touch completely on the topic of, of aligning with the internal customer. Like my first customer is the people who are delivering results for my second customer. Yeah. And one of the things that we've done for that is for, 
For our employees internally, we've gotten rid of all of our rules and policies that have anything to do with, face, with customer facing stuff. And we've said, your job is customers who stay, right? We're here to, we're here to transform the businesses that we work with and we'll give you coaching and support and whatever you need in order to be able to do that. Uh, but ultimately this is your call. Yeah. And so there's never a time where our people get on the phone with a customer and say, well, I'm sorry about our policy system because it, it doesn't exist. We have a set of values on the wall and that's it. Yeah. Well, that, still that goes back to, you could say, well, yeah, man, that's nice because you're running the company and the average salesperson can't do that. But, but you can, you can because you can, you can, if you break down this wall of I'm here to help the customer and you're the jerk employee who's trying to say no, right? If you break that wall down, and put them in a position to be able to succeed for a customer and coach them, like give them some coaching, give, give your internal person some value on understanding, put them in front of the customer, right? Make them a stakeholder in the conversation. There's so much you can do to make the internal person, to empower the internal person to create wins for you so that the next time you're out making a sales call, you've got people saying, you're basic, you can start taking orders at that point. Well, I don't mean like order taking, like, you know, the numbers game and eventually you get, I mean, like people will, you'll be attracting business instead of out trying to hunt. Yeah. And do you plan on hiring uh, and developing a business development group? I do. I, yeah. I, no, I have. So okay. I've hired, I've hired two people, both of them, their title is, has, ends in consultant and both of them are tasked with not closing. Now that's crazy talk, right? Like I know probably even you right now, you're, the hair is standing up on the back of your neck. No, I, I get it. I, I do. We, our close rate on business where we don't try to close is 71% on average. And it did not used to be anywhere near that. But people are, because of the, we get testimonials about our sales conversation. Like literally part of my, part of my pitch when I have to do a presentation is, Hey, if you call in and talk with, in this case, Brittany Brock, if you call in and talk with Brittany, she's not going to try to close you, but she's going to give you all the information you need to figure out, does this make sense for your company or not? And if it doesn't, that's okay. We can still be friends. You're going to get so much value on that call that with or without us, you're going to be better as a result. Yeah. But I create, and so all I'm selling is a, a, a no obligation consultative conversation, but at the end, they just, they just sign up. And is the key to pick judiciously those clients or prospects that you invest that type of effort into? Well, yeah. So part of the, part of that, that conversation we have with them where we're not trying to close, we've built that conversation so that the people who are not a good fit for our business and who we can't succeed for, and they're going to go out and poison the well, yeah. uh, that conversation turns them off. They go away. We've, we've tuned it that way on purpose. It's really, uh, it's, it's really, uh, I think a critical piece of our business because our phone doesn't ring with unhappy customers. When I go someplace, I have people stand up, standing up and spontaneously testifying about, you know, how, how fantastic our service has been. It's, that's my first experience with that. Frankly, Brian was, I had, a my first time out meeting with a group of customers, I was out there just putting my heart and soul into it. And, and one prospect stood up and said, well, you know, I've been using you guys and I'm not impressed. Just wet blanket, man. Like what, this is a few <laughs> years back, right? Wet blanket. And I just went, Oh, I never want that to happen again. And I, it was like, never, ever, ever sign up a customer that we can't hit a home run for never yeah. uh, because it kills you in the field. It, it, oh, it kills you every, in every direction. You know, right. This, uh, I think early in my career, I did a couple of marginal deals where it didn't fit, but they, or they misinterpreted it, or they didn't have, they weren't big enough, and they yeah. just turn into a nightmare. Yep. Well, and in the environment I'm in, there were 50,000 of them who were all talking to each other. Yes. Various forums and in meetings. And, and so, so the, the upshot of that is 50% of our business on average, just over 50% is referral business unsolicited referral business because That's we're doing nice. a great job, yeah. right? You can't afford to put an, like customer calls in unhappy, which is very rare. 
I give them whatever they want, man. I refuse to make a customer, even if, the, even if somebody had a bad experience and wants to leave us, I make sure they leave us feeling like they were treated fairly. Yeah. Like if, my position on that is if we are onboarded a customer that we can't succeed for, then give them whatever they need in order to feel like, hey, you know, we ended well. I do not want anybody out there in the field saying, saying something negative about us. Yeah. And how about you as a customer, when a salesperson works with you, what do you like and not like? Yeah. So the same thing, right? I mean, that, that, that was how I learned how to sell is, uh, there was, well, I'm going to use his name, guy named Dan Backman, smartest engineer I ever knew. Uh, he would come in, sit with us when we were spending many, many millions of dollars on technology back in, back in the heyday in Silicon Valley. He would sit down with us and every time he showed up, I became a better engineer. Every time that guy showed up, I knew how to be more successful. Well, okay, no brainer. I, I, didn't, I didn't care about competitive pricing and I wasn't looking for his PowerPoint. I, I, everything's online, I can find everything myself. I needed that company in my back, in, 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 in my corner, desperately needed them in my corner. Right. Because that, that sales engineer, that customer focused engineer, that's a very different job because a lot of people take it as I'm the bright guy who shows you up and tells you how it works, not how it solves your problem. Right. No, he was, he was solving problems for me. Right. He was helping me understand my problem. Yeah. Right. And, and so I just assumed he had the solution. Yeah because he wouldn't invest that time otherwise or. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. He wasn't trying to sell me anything, but man, we bought a lot of his stuff. Yeah. Holy smokes. They made lots, many, many, many millions of dollars off of us. Yeah. And where do you see the sales profession going wrong today? Well, I think it's starting to go a lot more right. I mean, there are, you? you know, your message is certainly resonating with a lot of people. Uh, and, and, I feel like, you know, a lot of the really bad sales I see is kind of the, kind of the low end consumer, you know, business B2C subscription stuff, you know, which is really, really bad. But I see a lot more people like you, uh, you know, with, with messages similar to yours or people who, you know, will see re responding to some of your, your epic, may I say, walking around the neighborhood videos, terrifying your neighbors. <laughs> I see their comments and it looks like a lot of people are starting to realize that, We've been selling wrong for a long time. Yeah, I think in a lot of ways it's a trap because you're under pressure and that blinds you from the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. And you tend to do the wrong thing and then it becomes a yeah. cycle. Yeah, and so the real culprit there is commission, commission plans, right? Compensation uh, plans. Well, it's, I, I, I see it more as management and leadership. I mean, well, yeah, they're the ones writing the comp plan. So yeah. they're, they're violating Goodhart's law, right? I mean, you're the, I learned Goodhart's law from you, actually. Yeah. They're, they're constantly trying to rework a, a comp plan that has, that has all these levers and knobs in it to try to coerce someone to behave a certain way. Yes. Which has nothing to do with going out and taking care of the customer. In right. Many cases. But, you know, like you, you're getting the most amount of revenue from the customers you are investing the most in. Mm -hmm. Right. And yeah. I mean, you are the, the focus of prices law where you're focusing on, <laughs> yeah. right. The tightest focus possible instead of the broadest possible. Yeah. I mean, that's the, that's the sandbox I play in. So, yeah. you know, and there are probably environments that aren't like that. And maybe I wouldn't be able to tell somebody how to succeed in those environments. Yeah, because I mean, if if you went to a VC, they'd be like, "Oh, you should hire a VP of sales, hire fifty salespeople, call all these places," but that doesn't work. In your uh, space. I don't think it does. No. Uh, so he, let me tell you, as a customer, some things that I hate: one, being prospected; yeah. two, being sold at; three, being closed. Right. So if you're teaching your people how to do those three things based on the old textbooks and giving them incentives based on that, well, you're going to get somebody's business, but it's not going to be mine. And I know a lot of people whose business it's not going to be. Right. Yeah. Because it doesn't assume you're a person. It assumes you're a persona. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, look, it's, what do they say? Sales is a number. I, I remember as a kid, my dad was in sales. Sales is a numbers game. It's like, really? 
is not you, you have to burn through enough people that hate you that you find the one who happens right. to yeah. want to buy what you want or what you what you want to sell and and today we don't have to do it because i mean the the small focus of people that would need what you do you can find them mm -hmm. and you can focus on them and mm -hmm. you know the problem that they have and you can converse to them about what they care about yeah and if they don't recognize it you're happy to find the next one it, right. instead of just calling somebody up and giving your value proposition, this is the three reasons why you need to look at this. Yeah. I know. <laughs> right. It's, it's insane. Well, again, everybody who's in sales knows what it's like to be a customer. And somehow, somehow we go from knowing what we hate when we're being sold at to thinking that it's a good idea because, well, my title has sales in it. It's like, no, Right. Well, we don't have that outward mindset that thinking like the customer, your number one principle. Right. And that is a superpower because until you can think that way, you're talking about what you care about, not what they care about. Well, so maybe they don't know how to think like the customer right. or maybe they have a bunch of metrics that are not oriented to help them understand. Oh, the they have zero metrics about that. Yes. Well, you know, so I don't know if you've read, uh, I'm going to pitch a book here that I happen to be reading. It's called the tyranny of metrics. Uh, uh, yeah. Phenomenal book, but it, it, he goes really in depth to help understand really he's, what he's doing is it's an expose on Goodhart's law. Yeah. Right. On how you, you incentivize people to do things that have, because you assume they can't understand the big picture. Like, why would you trust a salesperson to understand that we're trying to grow our business? Instead, give them a bunch of petty metrics to work with and manipulate them every six months. Right. Uh, you know, make it as confusing as possible and then get angry when they game the metrics. Right. Yeah. You t and then, <laughs> and you, especially, I've, I've been told to game the metrics. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, look, that was the, you know, there was a bank that a few years ago got in a lot of trouble because everybody was gaming the metrics. Right. I'm not going to, you understand. So yeah. Uh, yeah, it can be it can be institutionalized and devastating. Well, and people forget that sales is an effectiveness profession, not an efficient. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's amazing that people use those two words interchangeably. Right, they're they're opposites. <laughs> and, and and when quantity at a certain point reduces quality. Mm -hmm. Yep. So if you keep pushing the quality metric, you're reducing the. I mean, keep producing the quantity, you reduce the quality. Yeah, yeah. You lose your ability to be really good at something. Cool. Hey, this has been a fun talk. Yeah, um, likewise. Yeah, where can people go to follow you? Well, I'm on LinkedIn, Mass Strategic. Uh, that's probably the best place. I'm not as prolific as you are by any means. I, uh, our company is Client Focus Corp. Uh, Client, Client Focus is the company. Website is clientfocuscorp.com. Uh, but we have a YouTube channel where, where uh, you know, I try to be as good at eye candy as I can be. I'm not as good as you. <laughs> well, you don't have the movie star good looks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, but uh, hey, I just want to say, Brian, seriously, I think those, those videos that you're putting out are phenomenal. Obviously, the podcast is incredible. The videos probably felt like you were taking a gamble, but yeah. man, those are just outstanding. There's nothing like a little bit of irony or lampooning to really lay bare the, the nature of problems in a way that everybody can understand it.